y'all, Scott here. I've always wanted to be a remake, being a better version of my past self, maybe in HD or 3D. I always base my decisions off of what Crest does. But that of course means sacrifices are in order. I can't just go and remake the entirety of my life in 3D without the budget going through the roof. So I have to start cutting content. Yes, a new game console. I can't wait to play the latest and greatest. Don't look at me. Every single piece of thing is people saying, man, things were better back then. World War II, f that, it's all about the classics. To achieve a greater appreciation of a medium in its entirety, it's almost required to look back at where it was years prior. But sometimes, that can be an absolute nightmare. Access to older media may not be as readily available as the newer stuff, and that older stuff just may not have aged all too well. Which is why old media is sometimes reborn in a new age, retooled to be more easily accessible, remade to re-engineer that original piece of art into what it was always meant to be. Just kidding, it's for money. Remakes, remasters, re-releases, this is the best investment I made all year. Some may say these are all products of a lack of new ideas and creativity. The sentence is over. Remaking things has been a thing ever since the inception of things, and the core concept of it is great. Let's take a movie, for example, that may have been held back due to the time in which it was made, maybe due to budget constraints or lackluster special effects. Take that old movie and improve it, like a lot of films from the silent era were remade when sound was an option. But now, remakes of films aren't necessarily done to improve a film, rather, they're just easy ways to make a quick buck. See, I recognize those three words, I should see that! Oh man, I recognize these words too, I should do this! Video games, however, generally are a bit of a different story. The act of re-releasing is more of a necessity than a cash grab mostly, taking old games and making them available in modern times. Now, this can range from taking the original game and simply making it playable on a new platform, this is the saddest type of before and after, all the way to a from the ground up reconstruction of the game, rethinking the entire thing and redesigning it with modern standards and audiences in mind. Now, the core concept of the remake, remaster, re-release has changed drastically over time. The games that were once called remakes are now considered remasters, which have since been re-released and have been ported to other consoles. I've had it up to here with words. In fact, I'd argue each era of gaming had a re-release trend until all types of them just wouldn't stop happening, like right now. So let's look back at re-releases throughout history so we can actually figure out which is what and what is which. Of course, one of the first examples of the re-release was taking arcade games and translating them to home consoles. Here's Pac-Man and here's somebody trying their best. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, video game consoles just weren't powerful enough to replicate arcade titles, so developers had to remake the game from scratch to work on the desired hardware. Some of these games were decent conversions. Space Invaders was pretty spot on on Atari 2600, so it was Pong, Centipede, they did the job, but then you had Donkey Kong. Nice tagline. Of course, as game consoles became more and more advanced, they could handle arcade games much more smoothly. Back in the 80s, re-releases boiled down to just putting the same arcade games on whatever hardware they could. A new console's out, well surely we can squeeze Berserk on it. The Atari 2600 version of these games were just a means to play them if you had a 2600. The uh, same goes for most other platforms at the time. The developers knew these home console releases weren't the definitive versions, so when new hardware would come out, they would release a new version of the game for them. It was just to make these games as accessible as possible. When we when we reached the NES and Sega Master System, most arcade games that the Atari 2600 looked at you funny when you asked it to play actually played pretty competently here. But as home consoles gained more power, the arcades were that much further ahead of them. So here we have Strider in the arcades, and then the horror. That's why you had to upgrade even further to the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. The quality was much more in line with what you'd want out of arcade games in the home. So arcade games weren't necessarily remade from the ground up for some of these consoles. Many times, they were ports, a game made for one thing brought over to another. I consider ports to fall under the re-release banner if they released a good while after the initial launch. Sure, they may be downgraded or feature added content, but they're basically the same game. Yep, the 16-bit generation was where we started to see far more true-to-the-source material re-releases. However, it was also one of the first major times we started to get full remakes of older console games. Now, true remakes weren't really all too popular at this point in gaming. Uh, what was there to remake? Yeah, you know, with a bit more polish, that has potential. Sure, arcade games had to be remade to run on the Atari 2600, and various PC games were remade and re-released on home consoles or on PC again. But home console-wise, this was a huge step forward when it came to taking previous titles and remastering the graphics and sound and potentially even adding content to bring these classics into the modern light. 
Of course, one of the best examples of this is Super Mario All-Stars, a compilation of full 16-bit remakes of the four 8-bit Super Mario Bros. titles. They added the ability to save your progress, little extra details here and there were thrown in, new animations, the sprite work was completely redone to look the part of a new SNES game. These don't look like old NES titles, this looks like it belongs here. Some people prefer the Mario All-Stars versions of these games compared to the originals, but I prefer the original NES games. I'm more of a purist, I say, as I wipe the snot from my nose. I love All-Stars, but the physics are just different enough to make me actually hate it. Mario All-Stars was incredibly influential and in my opinion set the standard for video game remakes and re-releases. The idea of compiling old games and selling them as new games? That was genius and terrifying. I own 12 copies of Mario 1. This game really did pave the way for remakes in the 16-bit era and in general. Mega Man The Wily Wars was a remake of the first three Mega Man titles on NES for the Sega Genesis. Now Wily Wars is a little more rough around the edges compared to Mario All-Stars, but it's still a neat little package and they actually added an unlockable mode where you can utilize abilities from all three of the games. Then there's Ninja Gaiden Trilogy on the SNES. Oh man, they're the same games. Yeah, the music was updated to be more SNES-y. But the graphics, yeah, hey, 1995, 1991 called. It's really weird for me to see games on SNES cartridges that just don't look like SNES games. Like, by f it's Space Invaders on Super Nintendo. The original game came out in 1978. Well, now it's 1994, bitches. <laughs> I gotta check the calendar. Remakes and re-releases on SNES were generally remastered like Mario All-Stars, but remakes and re-releases on SNES didn't happen very frequently. They happened, no doubt, but they picked some weird ones. They remade Tetris and Dr. Mario from the NES. Why? Sure, it's two games in one, but these are remastered versions of NES games. Why not just make new versions of these games? They're puzzle games. It's like reusing bread. It's strange considering the SNES couldn't play NES games. You'd think Nintendo would capitalize on that and re-release more of their stuff, especially after how well Mario All-Stars did. But hey, I looked in the mirror. I'm not a 130-year-old Japanese company. I don't know what I'm talking about. In the background, though, the handhelds were an entirely different story. With portable gaming being a good bit behind console gaming, many developers discovered it would be pretty hard to bring their games over without huge amounts of sacrifices. But it would all be worth it due to being able to play these games on the go for the first time ever. Having to remake a game for far worse hardware, yes, that is considered a demake, and handhelds would get them all the time. Yeah, I wish I could never play Street Fighter 2 on Game Boy again, but hey, it's Street Fighter 2 on the go, maybe four more times. These early demakes for handhelds would lay the groundwork for handheld remakes to come. Uh, sometimes, if not most of the time, they would be lacking in one way or another, but they would often entice you with a few killer features. Back then, those killer features were almost strictly just portability. That was the core reason for buying these versions. But as the 3D revolution hit our screens with the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation, the idea of re-releases became much more enticing to not only developers, but consumers as well. Like, do I really want to be seen with one of these in 1996? Who'd want to see a fetus play Nintendo? Do you really want to keep your old systems around just to play Chrono Trigger, just to play Excite Bike, just to play old arcade games, when all of these games could definitely be played on your new systems? Well, these consoles were much more competent at emulating older systems without a ton of hassle, so much so that sometimes older games were just thrown into new games as bonuses. You could play the original Excite Bike and Excite Bike 64, the original arcade Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong 64, Galaxian was the loading screen in Ridge Racer, games that were once the hottest shit on the planet became waiting rooms. But when it came to full-blown remakes, Again, Excitebike 64, it has a 3D remake of the original Excitebike as an extra mode. Do you have a 3D remake of the original Excitebike as an extra mode? Fuck you, Donkey Kong 64. I believe during this time, developers were more eager to create brand new experiences, especially with 3D being the hip new thing to do. When it came to revisiting old experiences, they preferred just cleaning them up, adding some cutscenes and loading screens to Chrono Trigger and calling it a day. Resident Evil 1 started life out as a remake of the Famicom game Sweet Home, but it obviously became its own thing. That idea, however, taking this age-old game and modernizing it with a brand new direction and perspective is exactly what the gaming industry was going to experience a generation later with, oh hey, Resident Evil again. The GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox was the golden era of all things lazy. All types of re-releases happened. There were standard re-releases, old games playable on modern platforms instead of brand new ones that might have maybe pissed people off, remasters, old games spiced up for modern platforms with a few changes here and there that maybe probably pissed people off, and then remakes from the ground up reconstructions of games that changed so much that it probably sort of pissed people off. They covered all bases. A game I believe to truly define what a remake could be was Resident Evil on the GameCube, a remake of Resident Evil on the PlayStation. Everything was upgraded and tweaked to make this the definitive way to experience Resident Evil 1, although it's fair to consider these two as different games based on the same overall story and structure. Basically, RE Remake is what they wanted the original to be if technical limitations weren't as much of a thing on the PlayStation. It covers the same beats but added tons of stuff and gave the overall game the dark 
darker tone they wanted, but couldn't do because acting is hard. Stop it! Don't open that door! Similarly, Metal Gear Solid was remade on the GameCube as Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, re-engineering the title to be more in line with Metal Gear Solid 2 than the original, and it is way more over the top. Twin Snakes is some good stuff, but such a tonal shift from the original game that I think these two stand on their own rather than Twin Snakes straight up replacing it. But then we have Conquer Live and Reloaded on the original Xbox, one of the most love it or hate it remakes out there. See, they took this cult classic N64 title and made it gorgeous. It's insane to think this was on the original Xbox and not the Xbox 360. And while various tweaks were made to the gameplay to make this the overall better game experience, a little things were changed that make this version have way less charm. The animations are so stiff in comparison. In the original, Conker's entire face is fully animated to portray anger, sadness, happiness, you know, stuff us live people do. The remake seems to only really give him 2D eyelids to convey his emotions. Plus, in this M-rated game that is entirely focused on being crass and inappropriate, they only censored more stuff in comparison to the Nintendo 64 original. You're trying to tell me my Xbox can't say f now, me personally, I find it funnier when f***ing shit are bleeped, but it's just bizarre that while the N64 version already had some dialogue censored, the Xbox version has even more of it censored when this is supposed to be the definitive experience, and the Xbox is for people who love to say the word f***. Plus, the old multiplayer was replaced with a completely different online multiplayer mode. This is a toughie because while they tweaked various things to make the gameplay and presentation better, they even added new scenes that poked fun at this being a remake. It's obvious this wasn't just a quick cleanup job. The thing is, Conker's Bad Fur Day was beloved for the character of it all. I don't know many people who say, this game's humor is terrible, but god I love the gameplay. When you take one of the core gimmicks of the game being the fact that these cartoons swear, haha, how the story is actually very character based and is one of the biggest elements of the game, how all the characters were full of life and a unique personality and you censor more of it and make the animations worse, it's a tough decision to decide between the two. Do you want a better game or do you want the better Conquer experience? And see, that's one of my big issues with a lot of remakes and remasters in general. See, they take the original game and they try to improve upon it, but then there's those few little features they don't improve on. They either forget to or they change things up too much or they just remove features entirely. So that begs the question, why wasn't there Wii Remote support in Twilight Princess HD? The Wii U supports Wii Remotes. You could have had both the Wii and GameCube control schemes in one game, Nintendo. Why aren't you writing me back? But remakes weren't the only thing this generation experienced since the Dreamcast, you know, f***ing died. Sega brought over loads of their games to the remaining big three platforms with some new content added. Plus, they remade many of their classic titles in 3D via the Sega Classics Collection, alongside tons of compilation discs featuring so many classic titles, making tons of old school favorites playable in these things people were actively playing at the time. And then there was Resident Evil 2 and 3 on the GameCube. What the hell was going on here? I don't know why it took me so long to realize these are just PlayStation 1 games on GameCube discs. They didn't add anything, didn't change anything. If you played these games on the PS1, you played these games on the GameCube. I never heard anybody talk about the GameCube versions of these games, but for some reason, I always expected them to be somewhat remade along the lines of the GameCube remake. But if that were the case, I'd hear more people talk about these games that they were actually remakes, so I have no damn clue why I didn't expect these to be just straight up ports. This was somewhat unprecedented at the time, to just take an old game from the previous console and throw it on the new one with no enhancements, just another way to play these old games. If they release these two games a part of a bundle, a Resident Evil 2 and 3 collection, then it wouldn't be anything new. But while this business tactic was a bit abnormal at the time, it would later become so much more popular with generations to come. With the seventh generation, there was a huge leap forward with presentation. We got HD graphics, online play was the standard across everything. This must have meant classic games were fully remade from scratch. What the f is this? Welcome to one of the nicest infestations I've ever met. I'm not complaining, but an infestation still an infestation. This is what I consider to be the HD remake era. Games that were consistently called remakes back then. Oh my god, Three Man 3 remade? Do you have no shame? This is just the original game in widescreen. Yeah, it's a little bit crisper, but it still looks old. Models, the textures, they don't look modern at all. Like, I'll happily take the game in widescreen, but nothing else looks all too improved. See, we had tons of classic games re-released during this era through digital shops, compilations, or HD collections, and whenever it would have HD at the end of the title, it basically meant the only thing we did was put this game in widescreen. Let's get out of here! Here's my problem with these. Yes, it was nice to have these games in a slightly more modern format on a new console with improved visuals, kinda. But when you put these games in a higher resolution and that's all you do, it kinda makes the visuals 
look more dated this way. See, Resident Evil 4 on the GameCube, this game and the models were made for a lower resolution and thus it hides a lot of imperfections. They didn't put as much detail in some areas because the resolution would mask it. Resident Evil 4 HD on the Xbox 360, sure it's cleaner, but the fact it's now in HD, it's so much easier to see where this game has aged and it oddly looks older now. This is on the same console as Resident Evil 5, with them both being in HD, it's easy to see how these visuals have aged more so. I'm not saying RE4 is a bad looking game, far from it, but you can appreciate the visuals more in something like the GameCube version. Here it looks like a GameCube game running in HD, and it's harder to appreciate in this way. I like remakes when they upgrade the visuals to the point where you can't tell it's an old game. Nearly all quote unquote remakes during this era were not that. Like here, point out the old game. These remakes are more so-called remasters now, which is a much better term for them, and many describe them as they may be unimpressive at first, but they're how you remember the game looking. And when you see the original, it's like night and day. Yeah, with some games, sure, but most of the time, these remasters were literally just widescreen versions. Elise has made many games more readily available on modern platforms, but these remasters felt very budget. Obviously, these developers just wanted to make these games available on these consoles with slightly upgraded visuals. They didn't want to remake the entire game, so just throw together some HD collections where the game constantly swap between 4x3 and 16x9, this just looks bad! Devil May Cry HD, featured in the HD collection. Uh, listen, I understand why it flip-flops between aspect ratios. It uses pre-rendered video files alongside cutscenes that take place in-game. Uh, Devil May Cry was initially made with 4x3 in mind, so these videos are justifiably 4x3. The in-game cutscenes and gameplay, they were able to modify the code to run these in widescreen. The video files are pretty much stuck the way they are. I get it. Unless they wanted to go in and remake all these videos, they had to do it this way. But my problem with this is, when playing this game on the PlayStation 2, it's not all too noticeable what was a video playing and what was the actual in-game stuff. That was the point in making half of these things video files. When playing the HD version, it's immediately recognizable what's a video and what's not because of the aspect ratio, and at that point, I kinda wish they just kept the entire game in 4x3. It constantly changes, just don't even bother putting it in widescreen at this point. But what about in HD remasters when they take 4x3 video files and just stretch it into widescreen? What do you think this is funny? This is dumb. It looks bad. You're actively cutting off a pretty sizable amount of the footage. It shocks me the Sonic CD remaster did this when everything else about it is so respectable when it comes to preserving the game and giving players as many options as possible. Most HD remakes on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 were done on the cheap. Both of these platforms had limited backwards compatibility, so it just made sense to barf out ways to play these old games again, and that's all these things are to me. Ways to play these old games again. They may be in widescreen now, may look a little crisper, that's about it. At least we got some of them in fat collections, making them fairly decent buys. But see, I wish I'd popped in the Ratchet and Clank collection and had a cool menu with tons of extras and behind the scenes features, you know, scratch that, I want none of that. Oh my god, thank you, Sony! The HD remasters during this generation were fine times 10. Many of them looked pretty good and it was nice to be able to play these games in HD technically. But so many of them just made me feel... empty. Like, playing Devil May Cry on the PS2 just feels more right, while playing the HD version just feels more awkward. It doesn't feel right on this console for some reason, and the fact that these were considered remakes back then bugs me. And what else bugs me is I didn't realize that most of these games use the term remaster on their boxes. I knew a contradiction sounded good right about now. Now on the Wii, uh, things were a bit different. Uh, since it didn't output in HD, re-releases took on a different style. Here's Resident Evil again. So this is a port of the remake of a game that started life as a remake. It's basically the exact same as the GameCube version, just with more control options now. At least they labeled this as part of the Resident Evil archives, which does imply this is ass old. Two and three on the GameCube, I honestly wouldn't blame you if you were surprised they weren't enhanced in any way. There was the new Play Control series by Nintendo, which took GameCube games and enhanced them in some ways, most notably with motion controls. But of course, there were D-makes like Dead Rising Chop Till You Drop, a port of the Xbox 360 game. My god. Dead Rising Chop Till You Drop is best used to finish talking about the seventh generation and moving on to the current day, where remakes, remasters, and re-releases are all happening at the exact same time. We're getting pretty much every type of thing re-released now, with one thing type being very prevalent. The this. It all started in 2014 when Square Enix said, well, only 4 million people bought Tomb Raider, that's embarrassing. Less than a year later after its release on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, Tomb Raider Definitive Edition came out on Xbox One and PlayStation 4, taking a last-gen game and sprucing it up 
just a bit. It wasn't enough to really be this huge leap forward, rather it was a slightly better looking, better running version of the exact same game, it was the exact same game. This game would start a trend on these consoles. The Xbox One and PlayStation 4 had absolutely no way of playing older games at this time, so developers took advantage of that by re-releasing Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 games as definitive editions and remasters. The term remastered became a lot more widely used with video games during this generation, definitely after being used with The Last of Us. This was a great chance to make some extra cash while also giving consumers the chance to play some games they might have missed. Games from the previous generation didn't necessarily age that bad, so it just made sense to re-release them like this, but sometimes I felt like they were deliberately trying to give us not a deal. God of War 3 Remastered. All right, so guess which one's the PS3 version, guess which one's the PS4 version. They're both the PS4 version. Look at this, I don't see much of a difference. I mean, that's not a big problem, and God of War 3 was already a great looking game. I don't know what you could do to make it look that much better. But they sold this as strictly just God of War 3 for 40 bones when a fat God of War collection was released for PS3 including God of War 3. Why not release this entire package for PS4, remaster the other games even more, and if they were trying to lure in more God of War fans on the PS4, why release 3 when the first two weren't available? But then, we also get just ports. These aren't necessarily anything to write home about, there are ways to play old games on the new consoles, no new bells and whistles, no true differences, just... They're here, but we're also getting full modern remakes, taking old games and reconstructing them from scratch to either give them fully modern graphics or to just take the game and make a new modern game out of it. I mean, Shadow of the Colossus on PS4 is pretty much still Shadow of the Colossus after Shadow of the Colossus already got remastered on PS3 after originally releasing a Shadow of the Colossus on PS2. The Crash Insane Trilogy and Spiral Reignited Trilogy are still the same old games at heart, but titles like the Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes, Final Fantasy 7 remake, these are new games. They may follow similar paths as the games they're remaking, but at the end of the day, the gameplay is completely different. The level designs are completely different. They are fundamentally taking the core concept of those original classics and making new games based off of them for modern audiences as well as longtime fans. So, what the hell are these things? Well, I've talked about re-releases in the past, but that was more so talking in defense of them and the definitive edition craze. What we're talking here is the core differences between remakes, remasters, and re-releases in general. Remakes, I consider to be old games reconstructed from the ground up or with enough modern changes to make it almost feel like a new game. Remasters are more so polishing up a game, taking the core of it and not doing too much to alter it. Instead, tweaking a few things, adding some stuff, making the graphics look better. It's definitely a better game now, but still the same game at heart. And re-releases are just Resident Evil 2 GameCube. So, which games are classified as which? Well, I'm glad you asked because welcome to a safety hazard. We have a lot of remakes, remasters, and re-releases to go through here. Which ones are remakes, which ones are remasters, which ones are re-releases, which ones are gonna fall? We are really getting ahead of ourselves here. The Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. This one's an easy remake. It's the first three games, fully remade, from scratch, new music, new gameplay, new physics. It's going in the remake pile. I've been looking for a use for that thing. Secret of Mana on PS4. This one is disgusting. They took this beautiful SNES game and gave it the cheapest looking 3D graphics, but I have to give it to them. They sure did remake it. I think the best way to discern what is and isn't a remake is if they literally remade the game. Resident Evil 2, 3, and the Final Fantasy 7 remake. Now, I think a lot of people would automatically go, oh yeah, for sure, these are remakes. But let me open up an entirely new category here. Remakes. Games that are fundamentally new games with the old game's name. They may share some similar characters, plot points, and locations, but the gameplay is completely different. Things have been heavily altered, elements are added and or cut. These are pretty much new games disguised as remakes, but they get the honor of being called remakes. Dead Rising, chop till you drop, we'll just open up the demake pile here. This is Dead Rising, but it was heavily downgraded to fit on the Wii. So, yes, demake. Super Mario 64 DS. Yeah, I didn't really talk about handheld remakes throughout history, and that's because most of them are pretty much the same. They had some really cool stuff, and even if they don't add anything, the fact it's now portable is enough of a selling point. However, they all have at least one thing that keeps them from greatness. Mario 64 DS adds so much to the original game on top of altering tons of it. It's still Mario 64 at the end of the day, but they changed around a few things, and it is now really lame to control with the DS. While some things had to be downgraded for this to work on the DS, 
it's not a demake considering I think they added more than they took away, so I think this is more so in remake territory. Silent Hill HD Collection. This is a compilation of Silent Hill 2 and 3 in HD. Good for it, but it's not good. This is a buggy, amateur feeling remaster of these two games, but the studio who remastered them had to work with the code Konami gave them, which was unfinished. They didn't have the finalized code from the game, so they had to rebuild parts of it themselves. Does that make this a remake? I'll throw it in the Silent Hill HD collection pile to be safe. The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD and Twilight Princess HD remasters. These are both the same games at heart, but with HD graphics and quality of life improvements. I will say I remember Nintendo posting a comparison video of Twilight Princess HD showing how much better the remaster looked compared to the original, and I thought the original version was the HD version for a second. I don't really care for how Twilight Princess HD looks, but that doesn't make it any less of a remaster. Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D, the 3DS version of Donkey Kong Country Returns. It gets rid of motion control, offers new difficulty options, it includes new levels, it's portable, and it fixes my biggest problem with the original game. It's in 3D now. But the resolution and frame rate take a hit, it doesn't look as good. I would have said it was a remaster, but it was obviously downgraded to run on the 3DS. How about this? It's a D remaster. It's enhanced in almost every way, but was downgraded to run on the system. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening for the Nintendo Switch remake. It's obviously very, very faithful to the original, but with its new art style, it was obviously reconstructed for the Nintendo Switch. Resident Evil Remake. See, this is close enough to the original to be considered a remake and not a remake. Resident Evil Remake. It's the same game on a new console. Resident Evil Remake. Remaster. It's the same game, but it looks better. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D, Majora's Mask 3D, and Star Fox 64 3D. I'd consider these all remasters. They all play pretty damn similar to the originals, but they look a bit better and also have some quality of life improvements. Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary. I'd consider this a remaster. You can even swap between the original style and the new style on the fly. A Wii Sports Club, I think is a remaster. I had to remake it for Wii Motion Plus. They're the exact same games though. Silent Hill HD Collection. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas on Xbox 360. This is lame. This is the mobile phone version on 360. It runs weird and a lot of the user interface still looks like it was made for a touchscreen. Now, if you want to consider this as derivative of the mobile phone version, then it's a re-release. If you want to consider this as derivative of the original release, it's a remaster. Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story plus Bowser Jr's Journey. I think this is a remake, not a remaster. You could already play the DS game on your 3DS. Nobody was asking for this. I'm throwing this in the pointless pile. Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered on Nintendo Switch. It's not really that much better looking. They added motion controls. F*** it, re-release. You know, the line's pretty blurry between what's a remake, a remaster, and a re-release sometimes. And honestly speaking, that's pretty cool. It means game developers are doing what they want with revisiting old experiences rather than just sticking to what the true definition of a remaster is and nothing more. People shouldn't be so worked up over whether or not something is defined as a remake or a remaster or a re-release because with games like the remakes, it's kind of hard to tell what's even considered a remake anymore. While I definitely prefer when games get a full remake treatment like with Link's Awakening, I've come to respect remasters quite a bit more even if they aren't nearly as exciting. Well, I think I'm finally ready to start the 3D remake of my life now that my cost has been cut. Uh, I just want to see what my life warrants on the board. Son of a bitch! Hey all, Scott here. Imagine today's events occurring in the past. What would it be like to live in an era prior to this very moment? I wonder what I'm going to say in five minutes. What the hell is this? Why is it good? We need to go a hint closer to utter dog sh**. I said a hint. The year is 1987. This is what we call a video game. That was a short game of 20 questions. At the time, things could only go up graphically. They were trying all kinds of 3D styles. Some games you could hear crystal clear sound in with voice acting, and other games were movies you could slightly interact with. The future was looking bright. Imagine what video games will look like 30 years from now. Holy f it's wider? What's the main driving force behind new video game consoles? Better graphics. I'll let you shoot me in the foot if you look nice. We all want our video games to look better each and every generation, but sometimes it's fun not to care. The graphical style of older games were simpler, no doubt, but there was a certain magic to it, that old school Atari 2600 look. It's crude, it's not great, but there's something to be said about making the simplest of art understandable to the player, making it obvious to them that these are aliens in four pixels or less. It's oddly beautiful. 
let the record show I'm also legally blind. But when we move into the 8-bit and 16-bit eras, these are much easier to find worth in. A similar style of making the most out of limitations, but this feels more like actual art somebody drew that was then squished into a cartridge. 16-bit art is so much better too. This was taking pixel art and adding so many more colors and details in the music of this era. Oh my god, it may be a bunch of bleeps and bloops, but it's all organized in such a catchy and mesmerizing ways. Again, it's so cool how they would make something so beautiful out of something so limiting. And due to how simple things were, it was easier to immediately understand what make these games tick. Modern games are so full of cutscenes and 3D eye candy that it can sometimes distract you from the core of the game, which might not be that great. Because of this, the style of older games has never really died out, not only because less powerful handheld systems kept 2D pixelated jargon alive while the home consoles tried shoving f***ing polygons down our throat, but because people legitimately like these art styles, this music, these simpler, more get to the chase type games. It doesn't just remind people who peaked in high school of better times, some just like this kind of stuff. The problem is, most think older games look outdated and 99% of the time, they would be correct. So to get modern gamers to play the classics, you might just have to remake them. Giving them new visuals with all kinds of crazy effects, a fully orchestrated soundtrack, even more content. But like I said, many still value this older style of game. While some want these older games to be recreated for the modern age, what if we took this modern thing and tried to recreate it using this rock? This is a demake, remaking a game on worse and or older hardware, possibly generations older, or it's just made in the style of older titles. It's interesting to see how a modern game works when it's met with the limitations of living in 1994. It doesn't. Most demakes are fan made. Makes sense. If Nintendo isn't gonna put Smash Brothers on a Game Boy, damn it, I'm gonna. One of the most famous examples of this is Halo 2600, a demake of Halo for the Atari 2600. Now, to be fair, this is more completely different game in comparison to straight up playing Halo on Atari. I can't even begin to port these graphics over. Well, we can do the color green. No, this is turning the concept of Halo's story, characters, and some of the gameplay and trying to make it work as an old school Atari game. It's pretty neat to think about how you recontextualize things that have only ever been seen in first person 3D into a 2D sprite, and not just any 2D sprite, a bad one. However, I think what made this game truly famous in the D-Make realm was the fact it was made by one Ed Fries. He was actually the vice president of Microsoft's game publishing division up until 2004. So can you really consider this a fan-made D-Make when it was made by a Microsoft employee who worked with the Halo series? Well, this is far from official, Fries really this in 2010, six years after he left Microsoft, and even if he was still working at Microsoft when he made this, it was just a hobby project to attempt to make a Halo game for the Atari 2600. But it's more official than pretty much any other unofficial demakes, so you gotta give it credit. I think the Atari demakes are pretty interesting because I feel like you could make most games conceptually work on an NES or SNES with little issue. I mean, they would look and play wildly different, but I could fully imagine demakes of The Last of Us and Dark Souls on those platforms. These consoles can produce high quality gameplay and stories, Atari is a different beast. You pretty much have to rethink a game and turn it into a high score kind of deal. But fans have shown loads of talent by producing demakes of Super Mario Brothers and The Legend of Zelda. Mario is pretty impressively close. Zelda has more in common with a loading screen. But these are fan creations, the video game false profit. What about official demakes? Well, they aren't the most common, but when they happen, they really double dragon on Atari 2600. Gazunheit. You truly see the power of the demake with Atari. I mean, this thing runs on pencil lead. How are you gonna make Donkey Kong Jr. work on Atari? You don't. Now, Atari seems to be the furthest we can go back in terms of demaking, but how much simpler can we get? It's dangerous to ask me words. So we have Double Dragon on Atari or Double Dragon the LCD handheld game. Pick your poison. I feel that many would disagree with the notion that these are demakes, but if you consider Halo 2600 to be a demake, I think these fit the bill. This was the cheap alternative to buying a real man's handheld. The Tiger Electronics LCD games took the full name and branding of arcade and console games and made calculators out of them. These often are nowhere near replacements for the actual things, rather reinterpretations of the classics that can be displayed in a sticky notes worth of screen real estate. And damn it if that isn't a demake. Tiger games are pretty gross. They take the bare minimum concept of these games and make this. A high score based, overly simplistic romp that's just an endurance test. Hey, see how long you can use your thumbs. Nintendo had their own LCD games with the Game & Watch brand in which they themselves converted their games over to. These, however, are much more well designed. They're still simplistic, but there's more of an addictive challenge to these compared to what I found in a morgue. And when the game they were demaking for Game & Watch was too complicated for the LCD screens, they would make something entirely new for them, like with Super Mario Bros. and Zelda. The LCD demake is probably as low as we can go, unless you count charades. So instead of pathetic, let's try for Bizarre, my new store. Sega hit it big with the Sega Genesis here in North America with their previous console, the Sega Master System. Look at it. Does it look like it would do well here? 
Maybe Brazil. The master system was a long-lasting success in Europe and Brazil. They just loved grid paper and failure. While the console ended in 1992 here in the States, it lived on for years longer in other regions, especially in Brazil where it has yet to be officially discontinued. Maybe they just forget. But because of this success, D makes a popular Sega Genesis games were common for the platform. Sonic came over, though more so in specially designed games for the Master System. Streets of Rage, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, because good versions of those games weren't good enough. But the D make I want to focus on here is Street Fighter 2. Yeah, Street Fighter 2 on the Sega Master System, because damn, does that sound good right about now? Round one, fight. That hits the spot. Honestly, for a version of Street Fighter 2 on an 8-bit console, it's pretty good. I mean, character moves are missing, so it's not like a full-fledged port. It's not like this is the full Street Fighter 2 experience, just a little worse. Yeah, this banana was run over by my cart, but it's still the full experience. Nah, this simply does the job for Master System owners who wanted Street Fighter 2 and not much else. Graphically, I think this looks pretty damn good. Audioly? I do enjoy making soundtracks with elevators. For what it's worth, Street Fighter 2 on Master System is fascinating. It only released in Brazil in 1997 and Capcom greenlit it because they were duped into thinking this was a Sega Genesis version of the game. The developer then revealed they were playing on the Master System and they said, wow, this fucking stunk for the Genesis, but for the Master System, this could be worse. It was approved. Well, I'd rather play this than the Game Boy version, which that's only a D-make. The portable variant of a game was almost always lesser in every way. But just like Street Fighter on Master System, it could be worse. I think many Game Boy D-makes are fairly impressive. I mean, DuckTales on this thing is damn close to DuckTales how God intended. Developers had to choose whether to make a version of the game designed with the Game Boy in mind, or just try to cram funny shit in the car. It's a balancing act. Would it really be easier to make a Lion King game for the NES, or just take the SNES game and downgrade the hell out of it? This looks unnatural. Like, I feel like if I would play this as a kid, I would still think to myself, this feels like a downgraded version of something that already exists. I mean, designing a game from scratch for system is a lot of work, but it's also really hard to get the Lion King on SNES to run on the NES. You know the old saying. The NES got a few deem makes. I'd consider Mighty Final Fight to be one of these. This is a Final Fight game made exclusively for the NES. It's a retelling of the first game's story, so I would consider this a deem make. Take that, send it. However, everything else is really this game's own thing. If you consider Final Fantasy VII Remake to be a remake, give Mighty Final Fight a chance. This is definitely more of a spoof on the original. They made all the characters children and built it entirely for the NES. It was definitely meant to give NES owners a Final Fight experience while also making sure it could stand on its own, so they made it a joke. I'm a proud NES owner. Mighty Final Fight is its own thing and isn't bogged down by the limitations of the console it's on. Rather, Capcom used the limitations to their advantage while creating this thing. This is how you do a D-make and it might not even qualify as one. That's why we go back to the Game Boy line with Game Boy Color and Advanced D-makes. Finally, I can play Grand Theft Auto portably. I never said I was happy with my life. For some reason, developers constantly tried to take these big console experiences and shove them on the GBC. Resident Evil was being worked on, and while it was canceled, looking at what was accomplished, it's impressive and concerning. Think about how advanced society would be if we didn't spend so much time porting Resident Evil to Game Boy. I mean, this looks like it's straight up Resident Evil, but what ended up releasing was Resident Evil Gaiden, something more original for the system. They still tried to make it as full-fledged of an RE game as it could be, including this rhythm game combat mechanic to incorporate first-person shooting, which is honestly pretty clever. And of course, GTA 2. I'm sure not many people knew this was a thing, on top of the fact the first game is on here as well. In fact, that worked on the original Game Boy. These are like the coolest items at an antique mall. Absolutely jaw-dropping, but you couldn't pay me to lick them. These are really not great versions, but just the fact they even resemble a Grand Theft Auto game, I think is enough. Were you really expecting to pop GTA 2 into your Game Boy Color and be enthralled? No, this game was created with the intent of people saying, Grand Theft Auto on Game Boy Color, and nothing more. But thankfully, Grand Theft Auto on Game Boy Advance is another story. Yeah, most of the joy from this game comes from the fact I'm gutting people on two double A's, but this is a legitimate Grand Theft Auto with not a ton of concessions made. This wouldn't be considered a D-make, however, considering it's a completely original entry in the franchise. Now, Pac-Man World, that just got diagnosed. The Game Boy Advance was filled with multi-platform games that were completely different from handheld to console. I was definitely expecting this to be a 2D platformer based on the PS1 game. Was I ever gleefully disappointed? Hey, they took the PS1 game and transformed it into a 2D spray paradise. Is it better this way? Well, it depends on if you like dog sh See, this is the biggest issue with D-Makes. It feels like you're punching down. Well, the Game Boy Advance version of Super Sponge isn't as good as the PlayStation 1. Well, duh. Of course, what makes these games special is seeing how they convert elements that could only be done on the more powerful system. Sometimes they whittle them down to their core. Konami couldn't really port the first Silent Hill to Game Boy Advance, or they could, they just knew it wouldn't be pretty. So they converted it into a visual novel released only in Japan. See, while I would have loved to try Silent Hill on Game Boy Advance, 
We know it would have stunk. Sometimes developers have to make these calls. Should they demake the game for lesser hardware or create something more suited for it? Because even if they work on lesser hardware, I think I, alongside many others, care more about seeing it just exist, not necessarily if it's just as good or better than the source material. However, that can happen sometimes. Dark Void was a game, thanks for asking. One of the most forgettable and generic games from the Xbox 360 PS3 era. It was done by Capcom, but it was just so lifeless and lame. Just look at this cover, look at this name. Without the title, would anybody have gone, oh yeah, that's a Dark Void. It's just an underwhelming third person shooter that completely got overshadowed by its spinoff on Nintendo DSiWare. Everybody has that more successful cousin. Dark Void Zero isn't necessarily a demake, but it has the spirit of one. The concept here is, what if Dark Void wasn't an original game? Turns out it was a reboot or sequel to a lost Capcom NES game. You gotta hand it to them, they truly ran with this idea, even putting a fake history lesson in the electronic manual. Totally giving an excuse as to why it's on a dual screen handheld, because it was on the PlayChoice 10 dual screen arcade machine. They even got Jimmy Fallon in on the idea that this was, in fact, originally an NES game. When they break out the talk show host, everybody goes, oh sh. On that day, all late night with Jimmy Fallon viewers bought Dark Void Zero. The game itself actually gives off a lot of 80s Capcom vibes. Comparing it to the real life Dark Void, it kind of feels like how Bionic Commando on NES compares to Bionic Commando on Xbox 360. What an insult. The NES style is prime for demake territory. It's more impressive to demake for Atari, but demaking a modern game for NES, well, it just might be playable. Namco demade Pac-Man Championship Edition, turning it into something worthy of being on an NES cartridge. It was included in Namco Museum Archives Volume 1, and Jesus Christ, it might just be better than the original. To be fair, the original Pac-Man Championship Edition is good, but its aesthetic reminds me so much of the Superior Championship Edition's DX and 2 that it's really hard for me to go back to it. Championship Edition on NES oddly feels fresher even though it looks ass old. It's so addictive, and I think having this gameplay more zoomed in makes everything feel faster. It legitimately feels like its own experience, and honestly, if I had to choose between the two versions, I'm going NES. Retro City Rampage originally started development as an NES demake of Grand Theft Auto. It's a good thing they changed course. While it's obviously inspired by GTA and NES games, the final release is more than that. It's not GTA, and it couldn't run on an NES. While you could still look at it as a spiritual demake, the developer made sure you didn't have to look far for the actual one. Included in the Wii release is ROM City Rampage, a version of the game that runs on NES. Plus, they made a version for MS-DOS on a floppy disk. These people scare me. These are the fun demakes. They bring games to garbage hardware because now downgraded ports you could totally consider demakes doom on nintendo switch well they technically did demake it but that's not really too fun to discuss like here's rayman origins on xbox 360 now on wii now on 3ds how did they do it oh man they must have found the gaussian blur effect but the demaking spirit of going far back is still alive and well fans do it all the time final fantasy 7 on nes super smash land on game boy but even nintendo does it their prototype for breath of the wild was an NES game. They made Breath of the Wild for NES, and then made Breath of the Wild. Well, this is just a remake. I mean, they are super guilty of demakes in general. Remember the great Nintendo 3DS Wii U ports of 2016 and 17? Yes, Hyrule Warriors Legends. It runs. This is disgusting. I have no idea how anybody played this game legitimately on 3DS. Of course, it runs better on new 3DS models, but so would Molasses. Doesn't make it fast. I don't care. To me, this game just doesn't belong here. This gives off Lion King NES vibes. Just a sense of this not belonging. Everything feels off. Super Mario Maker for Nintendo 3DS, I think, feels more justified and it's still pointless. That's an insult to Mario Maker and an even bigger one to Hyrule Warriors. You can never upload stages with this version. You can only play stages that were uploaded from the Wii U version. At the very least, if they let you transfer stages you made to the Wii U to then upload, it would still be stupid, but at least there would be a way. No, here, there's no point to any of this, though it's still very charming to see this game run on 3DS. I just love how they had to downgrade New Super Mario Bros. U from the Wii U to this platform when New Super Mario Bros. 2 was on it and looked fine. They could have used these assets. No. It doesn't look not fine enough. The new Super Mario Bros. U art style on 3DS is amazingly pixelated, and it's funny because this is the art style they chose to represent on the box. Opuchi and Yoshi's Willy World is a great conversion. It looks and plays great, and I find it very charming how they converted the 3D world map into a 2D one. While the 3D map is cooler on the Wii U version, the 2D one on 3DS just flat out makes more sense. This is a 2D platformer after all. Regardless of if these are good versions of the games, D makes are amazing.
They may not be more fun to play, they may just be f***ing putrid, but they're just so damn interesting to analyze, every last one of them. To see how a game as massive as Breath of the Wild would work on NES, or just seeing Hyrule Warriors do something it shouldn't, I love seeing games represented in a different way than the norm, and these demakes help you to appreciate the game design. Without all those fancy 3D graphics, most of these games still hold up at their core. In some cases, they can be better not bogged down with cutscenes and loading screens. And it gave us a chance to play Rayman Arena on the PlayStation 1. Yeah, this is weird. So Rayman Rush is a demake of Rayman Arena for PS1. It removes modes and just focuses on this racing game mode. That's it. But even though it released after Arena came out in Europe, it released before Arena did here in North America. So if you live in Ohio, is this a demake or is Rayman Arena a remake? What about... Final Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition. This is a demake of Final Fantasy 15 for mobile phones. It uses a cutesy new art style and is played from a top-down perspective, but follows a shortened take on the same story. But man, they just oversimplified so much here. As a mobile game, it really likes it when you win, and the game just feels kind of mindless to me. At this point, you're better off just watching Final Fantasy 15 cutscenes on your phone. But then the demake got a remake with Final Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition HD. You can finally play this on Xbox One or play Final Fantasy XV, your choice. To be fair, there's merit to both of these games. A lot of people didn't like Final Fantasy XV, so you've got Pocket Edition, but a lot of people don't like Pocket Edition, so it's truly a matter of preference. Except on Nintendo Switch, where this is the only Final Fantasy XV you've got. Because who needs bullshit when you have dog shit? Hey y'all, Scott here, and what you're hopefully looking at right now is one of my favorite water bottle brands out there, Lake On The Go from Water Productions. I'm pretty brand loyal to Water Productions, but I won't just buy anything from them willy-nilly. They really have to prove the worth of their product to me before I buy. Water is back! Introducing Water ZEX Plus, the cooler, more anti pussy way of staying hydrated. It's Water ZEX Plus from Water Productions. This ain't your granddad's water. Well, I'm sold. Corporations have been reselling us the same products with a new coat of paint for eons, and video games are no different. Re-releases are a staple of the video game industry and have been prevalent ever since the very beginning. However, it seems like recently, they're starting to take over in the form of definitive editions. Some people aren't too stoked about this, but I myself am way into it. I am way into the preservation of games. I mean, just look at all these games. Other than a feeling of undeniable remorse, these games bring me nothing but pure joy. In my opinion, games need to be held on the same level as movies and books, and people need to ensure that these games can be experienced forever. Sadly, these days a lot of problems are coming up. Consoles and games are starting to become less and less reliable, disc rot is leaving some games completely unplayable, and digital stores on legacy systems are shutting down, leaving some digital games lost to the past. That's why I am wholeheartedly for definitive editions, ports, and remasters. These re-releases give games a new life and allow more and more people to play them, while also increasing their lifespan tenfold. Also, most of the time, these re-releases have all previously released DLC packed physically onto a disc, and I love that this digital content that could have been lost to the ages is immortalized on a disc. Now what's the difference between a definitive edition, remaster, and a port? Honestly in some cases, not that much. Many would consider the three synonyms for each other, and others would consider them all separate ideas. I'm kind of in the middle. A definitive edition to me is a jacked up game of the year edition. It's a cleaned up version of an older title with extra content that wasn't included on the disc originally, specifically DLC and patches. Examples of this would be Tomb Raider Definitive Edition, Dishonored Definitive Edition, and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. A remaster is more so focused on the graphics and improving problems the original had. Examples are Twilight Princess HD, God of War 3 Remastered, and Uncharted The Nathan Drake Collection. And a port is kinda just a nothing fancy, just making this available on newer consoles kinda thing. Games like Deadpool, Dead Rising 1 and 2, and the whole Resident Evil suite. Now in many cases, those descriptions could be swapped and it would still be valid, but with the examples I talked about, it's pretty obvious there's different tiers of the re-release. Re-releases have been incredibly prevalent this generation, the majority of which are older 360 and PS3 titles. This is definitely because the PS4 and originally the Xbox One didn't offer backwards compatibility. Tons of people are not okay with this. They want new games and lots of them, not these 5 year old games that are full price. Yeah, I get that. In my opinion, one of the worst examples of overpricing was recently in the form of LEGO City Undercover. Originally released as a Wii U exclusive for the retail price of $49.99, WB Games has finally gotten around to releasing the game on current platforms for a retail price of $59.99. The game's not even substantially improved, it has a new co-op mode, but that's about it. 
The Wii U version was even discounted to $19.99 recently via Nintendo Selects. However, in defense of re-releases, they are giving these games a new opportunity to gain more fans. So with LEGO City, which was stranded on a deserted console, the game can finally achieve wider recognition. If I owned a PS4 and not an Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3, would I really spend all that money to get one of those consoles to play Tomb Raider? The fact that it was released on PS4 means I'm totally more likely to play it and become a fan, meaning it's more likely the franchise will see more games and the industry will succeed. Now I'm totally with people who don't want nothing but these re-releases. Many have scoffed at Nintendo's first year Switch lineup because two Wii U ports are headlining it, but they're in addition to a handful of new original content on the platform. Plus, one of the Wii U ports came out day and date alongside the Wii U version, and the other has a ton of new content, so I'm okay with this. Sony, on the other hand, is quite guilty of oversaturating release years with re-releases. In the same year, Uncharted The Nathan Drake Collection, Tearaway Unfolded, God of War 3 Remastered, Journey, and Beyond Two Souls were re-released on PS4. The only original releases that year were Until Dawn and The Order 1886, also Bloodborne, but that was more from software than Sony. If publishers use re-releases as additions to schedules rather than replacements and price accordingly, then I see no issue with it. In fact, I encourage it. I'm more likely to and would rather fire up my PS4 than my PS3, or Switch instead of the Wii U, or Xbox One instead of 360. Re-releases give me an excuse to finally play games that have been on my radar for eons. I usually also re-buy 360 and PS3 games re-released on current gen and sell my old copy. Now, as a collector, that sounds strange, but re-releases these days are more so multi-platform versions of the same game. They're largely unchanged, and mainly just better looking, more fully fledged versions of the same games. It's like owning two versions of the same movie. If one version is better in every way and doesn't take content away from the original, what's the point of owning the lesser version? I'm never going to play the 360 version of Tomb Raider after playing the PS4 version, so I just sell it. Some people have problems with the price and demand that people who bought the original deserve the newly enhanced version for little to no money. Whoa there, I didn't know you were a member of the Entitled Emporium. Based on that train of thought, you should never buy a new laptop, or a phone, or a refrigerator, because in a year there will be a much, much better version for the same price. You pay a price to get something now, and you have to understand that value goes down over time. You paid to play this game when it came out, and now other people get a better value, but they had to wait a few years to play it. Definitive editions, remasters, and ports are good for the industry. As game development costs are going up, developers can sell their old games again with a new coat of paint, which can in turn help them fund projects and consider continuing fan-favorite franchises. I love having the option to finally play games that I missed out on, replay favorites with better visuals, and also resting easy knowing that these games will live on for a very long time. And here are just a few of my favorite definitive editions, remasters, or ports. Uncharted The Nathan Drake Collection was the way I played the first three Uncharted games, and they all hooked me. These games look great now, and having all three in one package is very nice. Tomb Raider Definitive Edition, again the first time I played the game, and it was wonderful, and it looks really nice on current gen. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, it may have come out just three days ago, but this is one of, if not the best Mario Kart to date, simply because of how much content is in here. Plus, the gameplay tweaks, while not making it feel completely new, makes the game feel fresh. I love re-releases, and I hope they continue forever, as long as new releases stay more frequent. But I'm done rebuying water! I've already bit the bullet on Water ZEX Plus, I don't need- Oh, I can't resist, I'm such a water fanboy. Hey y'all, Scott here. Well, I'm trying to figure out if the power went out due to the 11 train tracks worth of snow, or if my circuit breaker's being totally lame and not doing what I want. My circuit breaker's being totally lame and not doing what I want. I don't know what to do. I just called Circuit Breaker Studios and they aren't servicing this circuit breaker anymore. They totally retconned it from the canon and are doing a full-fledged remake of it in Q3 of 2018. There's just no originality in the circuit breaker industry these days. So why not encourage that lack of originality and talk about HD remakes I'd love to see. Allow me to slap a preface onto this. These are games I'd love to see remade or re-released. Remakes could be either a simple HD upscale or from the ground up a redo of everything. Re-releases could be as simple as just putting the game on a new console and calling it a day. Point is, these are games I'd like to see brought back. Also, just because I want a remake of a game doesn't necessarily say anything about the quality of the original. I'd just like to see it remade. Also, also, these are games I'd like to see, not you'd like to see. That's a hearty dose of Nana Nana and Boo Boo, but please tell me what games you'd like to see given an HD makeover or simply just re-released on modern consoles. And with that, let's see what I want HD'd. 
What a game. Super Mario Sunshine is fantastic 3D Mario fun with large worlds to explore and great controls to play around with. But it's not all perfect. Mainly the frame rate can get a bit wonky, the camera could use some work, and there was loads of content cut from the final release, such as more places to explore and a multiplayer mode. This game would be absolutely gorgeous in HD, plus it would be so cool to see this cut content finally finished and put back into the game. But at the very least, spruce the game up for an HD re-release, fix some junk up, and I'll be happy. Yeah, the game utilized the analog triggers of the GameCube, something the Switch doesn't have, but I think there are some definite workarounds, and it's not that big of an issue. I'd prefer the game to be included in a collection of all the 3D Mario games, but this is Nintendo we're talking here, they do separate re-releases. <laughs> oh, this series. Burnout is a stellar series of arcade racing games where crashing is anything but a hindrance. The first two games in the franchise kind of had growing pains, but are still pretty good, but it really starts really starting with Burnout 3. The franchise was just pure fun. Even the downloadable title Burnout Crash, in my opinion, was a cute little distraction. The problem was it was the last cute little distraction from the Burnout franchise and we haven't seen a new game since. I think it'd be stellar to see these games come back looking better than ever in an HD collection, preferably. I mean, I had to. Smash Brothers Melee is one of the most requested remakes for Nintendo to do. Competitive players want it to be basically Melee again, with everything kept intact, with better character models and graphics in general, and that's about it. I mean, I'd be totally down to have Melee on the Switch with better graphics. I'm not frothing at the mouth for it like others, but I'd definitely be excited if it were announced. Yeah, I'm still with us. Sonic the Hedgehog, released in 2006 for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, was supposed to be a fresh start and epic reboot of the beloved franchise, never mind. This is one of the most infamous games out there, being incredibly rushed, unfinished, untested, poorly programmed, designed, etc, etc, etc. But, I think it wouldn't be fair to say it didn't have potential. I mean, the development team didn't start working on the game with the question, you know what would be funny? Sonic 06 was meant to be Sonic's big leap into next gen at the time, and was meant to show everybody just how innovative Sonic can be, incorporating next level graphics and physics. It's obvious that the people behind the game wanted to make something grand, but due to insane time constraints, they had to rush it hard. What if a competent team had a chance to remake Sonic 06 and make it what it was meant to be and then some? Fix the story, fix the bugs, fix the gross art design, fix everything and make it actually good. That would be very interesting. And while we're at it with Sonic, remake Sonic 3 and Knuckles in the same vein as Sonic 1 and 2 on mobile devices. These are the best versions of the games and they deserve to be on consoles and PC, but not as much as Sonic 3 and Knuckles deserves to be remade like this. Widescreen, smoother frame rate and controls, everything from Sonic 3 and Knuckles combined into one tidy pack. Package. Beautiful. The man behind these releases in Sonic Mania, Christian Whitehead, showed off a working prototype of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, so come on, Sega, let's do it. Also, a re-release of Sonic Generations on current-gen platforms would be neat. In the depths of WiiWare lies a version of Konami we all deserve, a version of Konami that put out a series of games subtitled Rebirth. These were throwbacks to classic franchises like Contra, Gradius, and Castlevania. Contra Rebirth and Gradius Rebirth were original titles, while the Castlevania entry was a reimagining of the Game Boy title, Castlevania The Adventure. That game blew, but the Rebirth version is actually pretty solid. So what other Castlevania games should get the Rebirth treatment? Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest, surely. The black sheep of the original NES trilogy, Castlevania 2 was ahead of its time in some respects, but failed in many others, being cryptic, poorly translated, and simply not as fun as the original or Dracula's curse. Firstly, I'd love to see the Rebirth franchise to be reborn itself on current platforms, as it's just just kind of shipwrecked on WiiWare at the moment, but also I think it would be really slick to see Castlevania 2 redone as Castlevania the Adventure was. The four year long blood curdling scream, it also goes by the Wii U generation. While we were all patiently awaiting the next major Zelda title on Wii U, Nintendo decided to release The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD, a beautiful HD upgrade to the original GameCube game in 2013. That got me thinking what other GameCube games they could possibly remake in HD, and while my mind was on the topic of Zelda GameCube games, the first one I thought of was Four Swords Adventures. The 
four-player multiplayer Zelda title focused heavily on asymmetrical multiplayer. You all had to use the Game Boy Advance connected to the GameCube, so that way you could see elements of the game specific to your character on your screen, like if you go into a house or whatever while everybody else goes and does their own thing. The problem with this game is that it's just a hassle to play nowadays. Four Game Boy Advances, four Game Boy Advance to GameCube link cables, a GameCube or a Wii with GameCube slots, and a copy of Four Swords Adventures. I think it would have been the perfect game to be redone on the Wii U due to the gamepad screen. It also could have been the first and only game to actually utilize multiple gamepads all at once. Or if it couldn't have worked, it could have used 3DSs or something. Yeah, that would still be an investment to play, but at least it's a more current and viable option to play Four Swords Adventures rather than trying to find all the required components second hand. Nowadays, looks like we'd have to settle on a Switch version, which still could work. The game would have to utilize local wireless play where your friends bring their Switches over and play wirelessly, or Nintendo could add online play. Yeah, this method is even more expensive, but I feel like nowadays it's more likely for your friends who want to play a multiplayer Zelda title to have a Switch rather than a GBA with a GameCube link cable. Also, there is a mode in Four Swords Adventures only in the Japanese and Korean versions called Navi Trackers. From what I can tell, it wasn't localized due to translation problems, but if they could find a way to include it worldwide in a remake, that would be pretty slick. Also, it would be great if they included the original Four Swords or the Anniversary Edition in there and make it a Four Swords collection, but just adventures would be fine. I honestly just want this game to be more easily and readily playable, but instead of making it easy for everybody and remaking it on Wii U, Nintendo decided to remake Twilight Princess instead, an overload of Psy if I've ever seen one. Come on, you could already play the Wii version of Twilight Princess on Wii U, should've done something we couldn't already play on the platform. It's me, Mario! Ah, Super Mario 64, the 3D classic of all 3D classics. Problem with it is, there really is no definitive way to play it. The game was remade on the Nintendo DS with trunk loads of new content, but you had to play with the directional pad, which is a far cry from the full analog control of the original. So play the original, you get better controls, but miss out on the extra content. Play it on the DS, extra content, but worse controls. I think Mario 64 would be outstanding to see completely remade from the ground up, with controls as smooth and graphics as great as Mario Odyssey's, with all the content from the 64 original and DS versions combined. Or hey, you could just pick whether you want to play the original form of the game or the DS form on a menu screen. We've all had those sleepless nights where we can't stop thinking about how Virtual Boy games should have been re-released on the 3DS. I think I speak for all of us when I say that. The Virtual Boy, Nintendo's 3D abomination, had a hearty library of 14 North American games, a piece of cake to re-release. I would have loved to see a collection on the 3DS, but I guess we'd have to settle for the Switch if the 3DS keeps spiraling down the pit of totally dying soon. I don't think the 3D effect in Virtual Boy games is really all that integral to the gameplay, like nothing needs the 3D for accuracy in these games, so I think they would work fine on the Switch. It would also be really, really cool if they actually went in and tweaked them to be in full color rather than red and black, but I think it would be just cool in general to finally have an official way to play these games without eye strain on a modern system. But the Virtual Boy isn't the only system that's library desperately needs a re-release. The Satellaview was an add-on for the Super Famicom, the Japanese Super Nintendo. Think of it like a radio broadcast, but with games in addition to stuff like radio dramas and magazines. Nintendo created exclusive titles to be played on the Satellaview, and they would be broadcast to players in Japan at specific times. These included a full remake of The Legend of Zelda on NES, F-Zero Grand Prix 2, a version of Excitebike with Mario characters, and many more. Some titles actually had live narration during gameplay as well. These games can still be played via ROMs, but in terms of official Nintendo releases, they're basically lost to history. Bring these back and maybe even include a recreation of the narration as well, that'd be amazing. This one, man. Snatcher is a graphic adventure by Hideo Kojima, after Metal Gear, before Metal Gear Solid. It was really ahead of its time, and the only time we ever got it in English was for the Sega CD, meaning it's incredibly hard to find. Re-release the original with higher quality sound and graphics and I'll be happy. Beautiful Joe is an f and sick side-scroller where you and your annoying girlfriend are sucked into a movie and you have to save her. You can enter slow-mo for some pinpoint beat-em-up action or speed up. This game would look absolutely stunning in HD with its cel-shaded cartoony visuals, no doubt about it. I just want to see this franchise revived and with that, an HD remake of the first game and maybe even the second one would be greatly appreciated. Doshin the Giant, the greatest god simulator Nintendo's ever made, never made its way to North America. Only released on the Nintendo 64 DD in Japan and the GameCube in Japan and Europe, this is such a weird game I really want to play. You help out the people on the island and can also form the terrain as you please with your giant Doshin the Giant hands. Give this game a chance in North America, Nintendo. We need an HD remake. Imagine what could be done with this game on modern hardware. 
The Grand Theft Auto series is a homicidal rampage everybody can get behind. The trilogy of games on the PlayStation 2 are some of the best of the generation, and I think it would be really cool to see them redone completely to be on the same level graphically as Grand Theft Auto 5. Like, these games are still pretty fun to play, but characters can look like talking soup cans with legs. However, what I want even more are remakes of the top-down Grand Theft Autos 1 and 2. Modern graphics, but still top-down. There are definitely people who prefer this style of Grand Theft Auto over the style of Grand Theft Auto 3 and onwards, so bringing these titles back would be stellar. some of the most necessary remakes we need. Shenmue is a legendary series that started out as a graphical powerhouse for the Sega Dreamcast. The details, the textures, the voice acting, the amount of stuff you could do in it, it was like a virtual life you could live. You could play the game Hang On in the arcade, you can't get much more realistic than that. The problem with these games is that they're basically stuck on their original consoles. Shenmue 1 was only released for the Dreamcast, while Shenmue 2 was released for the Dreamcast only in Japan and Europe, with an Xbox release coming in North America. The problem with remaking these games is that they aren't necessarily going to win over many new fans in my opinion, unless they really put in the extra effort and remake these from the ground up. New models, new controls, new voice acting, the works. I don't see them doing that, and at the very most, if we get a remake of these games, it's probably going to be just a simple up res of the originals. I'll take it, I mean, it's at least a much better and easier way to play the games, but let's be honest here, a pure remake is really what these games need. The Game Boy Line was honored to be home to Nintendo's experimental phase with motion control. Kirby Tilt and Tumble, WarioWare Twisted, and Yoshi Topsy Turvy. All these games feature accelerometers or gyro controls and haven't been re-released since. Re-releases would be nice, full-on remakes would be really interesting too, maybe adding new content designed around the more advanced motion controls in the Switch's Joy-Con. I don't know, but I really want to see these titles come back. Oh baby, oh, F-Zero GX is the peak of the F-Zero franchise. It was also the death of the F-Zero franchise. On consoles, that is. Just up res this sucker, throw it on the Switch, bada bing, bada boom, perfect. Also, it would definitely be pretty cool if its arcade counterpart F-Zero AX is included in the package. It was on the disc of the original, but this time, make it wholeheartedly accessible. Red Dead Redemption, one of the great open world games of all time is a sequel. I feel like not a ton of people know about this, but Red Dead Redemption is a sequel to Red Dead Revolver, and I think this is a prime candidate for a remake, because it's a quality game and not as many people know about it as they should. It could be a simple up res or from the ground up, I'm honestly not too picky about this one. One of the most unique horror games ever conceived, Eternal Darkness requires an HD remake. And when I say remake, I mean from the ground up. The game utilized sanity effects, which would break the fourth wall and mess with you, the player's mind. Everything from the volume control going up and down to the game acting like your save file is corrupted. I feel like this generation could bring forth so many more unique and effective sanity effects. Plus, this game definitely needs another shot in the limelight. Shadow of the Colossus got a remake only Legends could possibly deserve on the PlayStation 4. It wasn't just an up-res of the original, like the remake of the game on the PlayStation 3 was. No, 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 they recreated the whole thing. But the same team who made Shadow of the Colossus also made the game Eco a few years before. That team being Team Eco, funny how that works out. i just like to see it done. I mean, if Shadow gets it, surely Eco could use the same love and attention in terms of a remake. And yes, I know it was remastered for PS3. I'm talking a remake like Shadow of the Colossus for PS4. Mega Man Powered Up was a remake of the original Mega Man game on the NES for the PSP. It flopped, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a really cool idea. It completely modernized the 8-bit classic and turned it into, frankly, something completely new. That's really cool, and I want to see the original remake brought back on newer consoles. And with that, let's see the same treatment for Mega Man 2, make a Mega Man Powered Up 2. And while we're at it, remake Mega Man The Wily Wars. The Wily Wars was the first three Mega Man games remade for the Sega Genesis but it was only released via the Sega Channel, an early online video game service here in North America. It included a super interesting mode after completing all three games called Wily Tower, where you could equip a bunch of different abilities from each of the three games. Give this one a second chance, Capcom. Either just re-release it or remake it with some great new remixes of the old tunes and new sprite work. Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap, now that's what you call a remake. Originally released as a Sega Master System game in 1989, the developers at Lizard Cube totally revamped the entire game with a gorgeous art style, making the game an absolute joy to look at. It's still the same 8-bit game at its core though, it even allows you to immediately swap over to the original look. I'd love to see other retro games get remade in this manner, I mean look at this, tell me you wouldn't want to see games like Star Tropics, the other Wonder Boy games, Molt Mania, and...
Anybody remember Metroid Zero Mission? A full reimagining of the original Metroid game on the NES, modernizing it to play much, much better. Why didn't the original Legend of Zelda get that treatment too? I enjoyed my time with the first Zelda game, but there were definitely various things that don't age all too well in this day and age. It still invokes loads of charm, but also loads of high blood pressure. I think remaking the game in a respectful manner would be great. Make some things less cryptic, make a few things more obvious, just make it more playable without a guide. And I'm not asking for the game to be dumbed down. Just as an example, I'd like it to make useless and cryptic hints a little more clever, thought-provoking, or just more useful. Like, we have much better localization nowadays. I think with a beautiful hand-drawn style like Wonder Boy and some much-needed tweaks here and there, Zelda 1 can be more easily accessible and enjoyable. And while we're at it, some HD versions of the N64 Zelda remakes on Switch, please and thank you. And there you have it, and I know I probably requested something really lame in there, but come on, when the power's dead, so is all integrity. Oh, I guess it wasn't the Circuit Breaker after all. The power's back on! And to think all it took was a loss of credibility.